All right, so this is Tracy, because tracing user input through JavaScript is for tools, by Jake Heath and Michael Roberts. So Jake is a penetration tester with NCC Group. Jake performs web application and network penetration tests, as well as various types of hardware engagements, including hardware teardowns, physical threat modeling, and secure boot implementations. Michael Roberts is a penetra penetration tester with NCC Group. Michael performs web, web, mobile application, and network penetration tests, and has a passion for virtual reality and machine learning outside of work life. Please welcome Jake and Michael to uh, Silicon 2018. Er yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so this talk, uh, we're going to be talking about a, a tool that Michael and I wrote, um, mainly for work. Um, there's this uh, essentially vulnerability called uh, cross-site scripting. Um, how many here are familiar with cross-site scripting? Does everyone know? Okay, so this is a small group, so I'm just going to like talk to you individually. Uh, uh, so everyone seems to really kind of know what it is. Um, so uh, cross-site scripting is a super old bug that we still find on pen tests all the time. Uh, blue team people hate us because they feel like they every time they introduce a new feature uh, and they have a pen test, we end up finding some kind of form of cross-site scripting in it. Um, and even though it's still like a really well-known and like well-studied bug, uh, it's still like prolific throughout the web. Uh, and we kind of hate finding it. So we wrote this tool to help uh, essentially automate most of the workflow uh, that's going, that goes into uh, identifying vulnerable cases and uh, essentially organizing all user input within a web application. Um, yeah, so you already got a nice intro, so I'm just going to kind of skip through that so you can get to the cool stuff, which is like a demo. Um, yeah, so the three things that we want to talk about really quickly are uh, why we wrote this tool. Um, there are other XSS tools, and we'll kind of like uh, try to essentially give you a, a thesis statement for what we wanted when we wrote the tool. Uh, we'll go through those other existing tools hoping to defend ourselves like why we needed another tool. And then we'll just kind of do a demo of Tracy. Um, so we started with this uh, idea that we wanted to eliminate this problem. Uh, we were really tired of it. It's not fun to find. It's not challenging anymore. Um, it's pretty much automatic when we go on site. We have a website. Uh, we can find cross-site scripting pretty quickly. Um, but pretty quickly actually is about like two or three days of testing. So that's a lot of time that uh, I end up wasting. Uh, when There are other like more complex bugs that uh, um, computers aren't as good as finding like access controls and um, uh, things like that. Um, and we want to eliminate the, uh, the problem of cross-site scripting uh, using two main things. Uh, the DOM is the big one. The DOM knows everything. The DOM knows what's rendered in the page, what scripts are um, hitting, what JavaScript's rendering, um, when and where. Uh, so it knows everything, and uh, we really wanted to capture all that data so that um, we essentially want to capture data that's already in the DOM and use that to um, help our you know, pen testing. Uh, the other thing that we really wanted as like a keystone for this tool was we wanted it to be human-driven. Um, we didn't want this to be like some kind of automated scanner that uh, automatically like fixed all cross-site scripting. We knew that was kind of like a, a long, uh, a long ways away, and probably wouldn't work ever really that well. Uh, we wanted the human to be able to like kind of navigate some complex UI flows. So this is you should think of this tool as more of like an augmented um, uh, tool t uh, assister, like rather than an automated tool uh, scanner. Things that we're trying to avoid. Um, AI, automated scanning, static analysis, blockchain, all that buzzword stuff. Uh, we're trying to avoid using that kind of technology because, again, we want to keep the control in the pen tester because the pen tester actually knows um, a lot. They, they, they just need a little help organizing their workflow and essentially getting uh, all that data organized. All right, before we talk about Tracy, let's talk about some of the existing toolings and methodology that's used by testers now. Uh, the first uh, methodology is the shotgun approach, which is pretty much you just take a XSS payload, you just insert it into every input field in the web application, you browse around and try to find where an alert box pops up. Um, there's some pros and cons to this. Uh, the pro is like it's super easy. Uh, it requires very little knowledge to just put in payloads into the application and it's fast. The problem is is that you don't really know where your input is going in and where it's coming out. Um, so whenever you like find an alert box, if you don't like label that alert box, 
you won't know like where you originally put it. Like sometimes an alert can pop up like three or four days later and you're just like, I don't know where I put that input at. So you have to go back and hunt for it and um, where you put it inside of the application and it can be kind of tedious. It can also be really annoying. <laughs> if there's a lot of XSS in the application. You'll just get alert boxes for days and you won't um, be able to like figure out, like, like the application will become unusable at that point. And um, the other problem is that there is no, um, well, there is a concept of a DOM. I'm not sure why that bullet point is there. It says Burke has no concept of a DOM. Oh, yeah. Um, but if you're just using the shotgun approach, it would. Uh, so static analysis um, is another approach where uh, you pretty much, uh, like this is an example of like burp, where it has the ability to look at the flow of the code and determine like the sources and sinks um, and figure out whether there would be excess that way. Um, there's also some other software like um, check marks, which um, also, not check marks, it's, is it check marks? Oh, for the static analysis. Uh, just like in general. Anyways, um, there is uh, very little user input. Um, it can find hidden logic flows, something that's really hard whenever you're like testing by like the shotgun approach. There could be like hidden uh, flows within inside the application. There might be pages you don't know about and stuff like that. But static analysis has a full uh, understanding of like the code and where everything goes, hopefully. Uh, it's not intrusive. You won't break the application by running some static analysis on it. And it has a, like a very low like learning curve for like a user to run against it. Uh, tuning, on the other hand, is um, a different thing. Uh, problems with it is it's often really costly. Um, some of the software that does static analysis can run you. They do like a user uh, per repo model and like per run model, where whenever you run it on the code, um, you'll. Uh, it requires like money, and then for each repo, you'll have to like pay each time. Uh, there's also a lot of false positives or false negatives. Um, this is the case if you just like take one of these uh, pieces of software and run it like outside the box. Um, there's a lot of like tuning that's involved with actually getting good results, um, and it can be really time consuming. And you kind of have like have a deep understanding of how the code works to be able to tune it properly for your code base. It's not something that you can just take off the shelf and run against some software and magically get it to work. Um, it doesn't really have a, like the concept of like the DOM. Like it doesn't know like what happens when the it actually is displayed to the user. So if there's any like there might be XSS server side, but on the client there. Are, there might be some JavaScript sanitization that's going on. So you won't actually know. Um, that doing regular static analysis on like the server side code. So it might uh, have false positives that way too. And then another part is you have to be able to actually have all the source code. Like if you want to do static analysis against the, the target, you need to know like the source code. So you can't use it in like a black box situation. The other things is um, there's like another set of things where um, they do like a fork of the browser and they do some like taint analysis, like a uh, blue closure. And um, there's also like a fork of PhantomJS that does this. We don't exactly know how blue closure works because they're very secretive about uh, how that technology works. Um, but like I said, uh, our idea from like reading their like guidelines and stuff like that is that it's just a fork of the browser, and then they hook the JavaScript functions that are inside that browser, and then look to see the code that's flowing through it to kind of understand what's going on. So the pros and cons is that it has like a deep understanding of what's going on in the JavaScript because of all this uh, like taint analysis stuff. And it can have an understanding of the DOM because it is in the browser. It can also know how to unlock new paths. Um, it can know like that a user input needs to be like this to be able to like pass a certain check and stuff like that. Uh, the hard part is keeping it up to date um, and the learning curve 
that's used for these applications. Like it's not part of your standard workflow to use these applications. Um, they have like whole new UIs and stuff like that. And they're often quite costly from what we could tell. So now that we've looked at the competition, let's go into details about how Tracy works. Uh, there's really three main components of Tracy. There is the plugin, um, the API server, and the proxy. Um, the plugin or browser extension uses a set of APIs to be able to monitor the DOM. Um, so, like your normal workflow would be to install this um, plugin or extension into your browser, and whenever you do that, each page you load actually uses this mutation observer API. Um, and so, the way that this mutation observer API works is you can set a um, mutation observer on the whole DOM. And whenever there is a mutation to that DOM, anytime there's like a write or um, a modification of an attribute, it'll actually fire an event and tell you that like there's been a write to the application. And then we can look at those writes to the application and determine if our user input was ever written down to the, the DOM and how it was written to the DOM. So a normal Tracer workflow would be um, you install the plugin, uh, and then you start up the server and you go to the website. Um, whenever you go to the website, there's this drop down menu uh, by clicking on input boxes, which allows you to select like, different kinds of payloads. In this case, the payload is a plain payload because it's a username, and most of the time you cannot have special characters with inside the username. And then you can enter a password, and then whenever Tracy sees that username, um, in anywhere within inside the application, it will flag it and tell you in the UI where it was written into the DOM. So in this case, you can see that the top bar uh, has the on each page has the user's uh, username, and you can see like where it was written into the DOM at. So we can use this ability to track the DOM to find XSS. Um, we use a polyglot. You can see here. Um, that there's like this double quote, single quote, and then the brackets. Um, so what we're trying to do here is trying to trigger some kind of DOM mutation that will we can detect. So if your um, application ever, like if your user input ever becomes a attribute name or a DOM um, element, you know that there must be access because that's usually impossible because the user shouldn't be able to control an attribute name or a DOM element name, which a DOM element name is like a div or like an input box, and an attribute name should be like a value or on error or something like that. So by looking at those like mutations and like breaking out of like the certain context, we can tell whether there's XSS or not. Um, so I think it's easiest to kind of see a demo of this like working in action. Um, and I've got like a, a VM here set up uh, with the UI. And then um, how we're going to demo this is, uh, has anyone ever used the uh, Google's XSS game before? It's like a, a fun little like tool that you can, um, you know, play around with like cross-site scripting bugs if you've never done it before. Um, and so I've got Tracy installed. You can see the little owl up here. And um, this is kind of the UI. Uh, the way that you should read this is um, on the left is going to be all of the user input. So it's essentially a table up here in the top um, that'll show essentially every time I've put in uh, user input through a text field or an HTTP request or something that essentially goes into the application. Um, and then this will be like kind of an extended view of uh, the HTTP request that was used to issue that, uh, that injection. And then on the right um, is going to be the, the, the inverse, so the outputs. Uh, we consider outputs to be a lot of different signal, um, but the main one that we care about is when it was written back to the DOM, so and um, where it was written. So there are DOM writes, but there's also HTTP responses. There's also uh, we hook the inner HTML method function, and we make uh, that a part of our signal, so that'll show up in there as well. Uh, it's usually used because sometimes you can get cross-site scripting through inner HTML, but uh, we have a lot of different other um, like hooks that will show up in this output. Um, and then in the bottom right, same thing. It's just an extended view of the of the event. Uh, usually, it's like the actual HTML that was written into the DOM, and you'll actually see all the encoding and whatnot. So uh, if I get started with this game, <coughs> we get kind of presented with this application, 
And uh, we're looking for cross-site scripting. And I happen to know that this one's pretty simple. If I just type, you know, I'm going to search for Jake. Uh, oh, I noticed the, um, you know, I get a query parameter in the top right uh, for Jake, and it gets reflected back to me. So this is um, likely a case of reflected cross-site scripting. So um, I want to show you kind of how you would use this uh, Tracy to, like, solve this problem. Um, it's pretty trivial in, like, this case to use, like, a script alert, which would be pretty um, easy to, like, create an alert box. Uh, but you can see at scale, when you don't know which inputs are going to trigger uh, cross-site scripting, having it all organized in one app is, is kind of like a, a desired workflow. So um, if I click over here, I can get this like Tracy context menu, and it's the same menu that Michael showed in the, in the slides. Uh, but I can essentially generate a payload that's our polyglot, and it generates this automatically. And uh, now that Tracy has this in its database, any time... T B R L O X K M S V is seen in the DOM. Uh, we'll get an, an uh, <coughs> excuse me an event uh, for that particular um, uh, DOM write. So when I uh, go back to the UI, uh, let's sorry, let's try this again. Sorry, I do a search here. So you can see it. You know my payload doesn't show up like before because, and I get this little alert from Tracy saying that there's a vulnerable case of cross-site scripting, uh, and it's likely because we broke the DOM, and we can actually see exactly what happened. So you see here on the left, we got the the user input. Um, I apologize because the this UI is like kind of um, squished just so that you can see it on the screen, but um, it's just a table of all of the information that was used to gather the event. This is the Git request that was used um, to make to the application to inject that uh, user input, that USGF. Um, and then this was the output. So uh, Tracy, the extension, noticed that our input was actually output in the DOM as a node name inside of this uh, B node tag. So you can see that here inside of a B. And uh, since this is actually in the DOM, we know this is not encoded. And we can know that this is a vulnerable case of cross-site scripting. Uh, so now, like to get through the next page, I'm just going to do um, a quick proof of concept to get through. Oops. Oh, oops. That. Oh, what am I messing up here? You didn't ever close that one tag. I didn't? Image. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. All right, cool. Uh, so that's like a reflected case. So if we go to the next page, um, we get a more interesting case of like DOM-based XSS. So um, in this particular case, there's like a chat window, and you can type, you know, Jake. And uh, without making an HTTP request, it's already put in the little chat box. Um, and so DOM-based cross-site scripting is actually kind of complicated to find in practice because uh, it requires the pen tester to, like, see uh, the whole application as it's acting um, at once. Uh, and this is the actual good, really nice case that Tracy has where since it has access to the DOM and it's watching constantly, it can see modifications as you're pen testing. Uh, you don't have to like change your workflow really at all. Um, the only thing that you have to change is by instead of you know typing you know your your normal uh, script alert, you can type uh, nothing and have Tracy generate a payload for you. And since now this is in Tracy's database, um, Tracy will see this get written to the DOM. And uh, when it does, oh cool, we have a no little notification, and uh, it tells us that oh this has broken the DOM in a predictable way just like before. Uh, and in this case, we get two events: one for DOM write. So this is the actual raw DOM write that, without encoding. And we can see it's the same case where it's broken out of this block quote, and it's made its own DOM node. So we know that it has to be vulnerable. Uh, and we also get a, a, an event for inner HTML because of how we hook the inner HTML function and how inner HTML is uh, particularly bad, and we want to know about it when people are using it. So that's why we have two events here. Um, so in the same way, we can do our proof of concept once we know a vulnerable case exists. Cool. And we get our alert. Nice. So uh, this next case, uh, so this is a inner HTML case again. 
uh, and we can kind of like see the code to see exactly what's happening. Um, so in line 18, this line right here, it's taking uh, this num value, which is user supplied, and it's calling the jQuery.html, which is actually just a wrapper for um, inner HTML. And uh, so this is obviously going to be a case of cross-site scripting, um, but it's essentially these numbers up here are user supplied. And uh, what I can do is essentially put our Tracy payload in again. And uh, if you give it a second, cool, notification. And uh, we can see all the events for when the DOM was written. It's actually two DOM writes. So first the iframe, which is like <laughs> just the iframe that's used to load the page. And then this, uh, this image is loaded. But the more cool, interesting example in this case is this image um, inner HTML hook. So we actually know they're using inner HTML to write this exact text without encoding. And since it breaks the DOM in its predictable way, uh, we get the uh, known vulnerable case of cross-site scripting. So, oops. Um, I think that's probably good enough. Uh, there's another example on here. Um, yeah, why don't I show it? Since it's, it's what? on air. It's just on air? Yeah. That's right. That. Nice. All right, yeah, let's do one more example. Um, so this one's a little trickier, uh, and I'll show the code again to see why it's trickier. Um, but essentially what happens in this case is this image, uh, this image tag, has an onload property, and onload or on event handlers are actually evaled, uh, so which means they take the string inside and they run eval on them. Uh, and if you control user input inside of an eval, it's almost a guaranteed case of cross-site scripting, as long as you know that they're not encoding it in some kind of protected way. Um, and in this particular case, uh, timer is under these little um, hamburger um, quotes, so that it's replaced with something that you supply. So. Uh, the idea is that you would break out of this start timer call and then eval your own code. Um, and Tracy can even find cases like this, even though it's a little complicated. Um, but you'll see that if I use instead of three here and I generate a, a Tracy payload, um, it won't be, it won't give you the three that we really want because three is pretty much guaranteed. But it does give it a two because it thinks this is pretty bad because it knows about um, on event handlers and it knows if user input ever gets inside of a, an on event handler, um, it probably should get checked out by the pen tester to make sure that it hasn't been encoded. But there are cases where essentially this will be hard to execute arbitrary JavaScript. So that's why we give it a two instead of a three. Uh, but you still get the nice little notification. So while you're pen testing, if you end up uh, firing that event, um, it'll kind of alert you to, the, uh, to that bug. Okay. So I'm going to go back to slides here. Now we have a good, uh, good idea. So uh, what can Tracy do? Uh, yeah, so it's not eliminating cross-site scripting, correct. Uh, but it is hopefully reducing the barrier of entry to um, cross-site scripting so much that even QA people can find these things. Uh, the idea is that we would be able to like, have you set up a Tracy environment with QA or testing or you know, like maybe even your bug bounty team so that they can just essentially peel these off without you really even having to look through them. Uh, and it's all done dynamically, which is great. Uh, the other thing that it gives you is it maps all inputs to outputs. That's what you saw with the left versus the right. Uh, all that left stuff is user input into the application, and um, all the rights are the uh, outputs. Um, ideally, you'd be able to use this to like maybe generate other kinds of tools to see uh, what kind of taint goes into your application and how it's rendered. Um, it can automatically discover vulnerable cases of cross-site scripting. And um, pretty soon, as in like this morning I committed it, uh, it can generate automatic reproduction steps, which is pretty cool. Because since it has all the data uh, from the DOM and it creates like this map of inputs to outputs, you can generate reproduction steps uh, automatically. Um, so this is just a project that Michael and I work on in our spare time. We would love uh, a few extra hands if we can get our, um, uh, our hands on them because it, it needs to be more stable, which is, uh, would be great. Um, 
The other thing that we would like to get more of is signal. So um, outputs are varied. Like the DOM rights are like a big part of that. And that's really the only thing that we care about. But uh, there are a couple of function calls that are super important that we want to catch, which are like eval. We want to be able to essentially hook eval and um, see when users are using eval within their JavaScript to execute user-controlled input. Uh, turns out hooking eval is like super difficult because of reasons. Um, same with set timeout, same with set interval. And uh, there's a lot of other signal that we'd like to gather, essentially. Um, Tracy should be monitoring everything while you're pen testing and collecting analytics. Um, we have front-end fuzzing now. We have verification of XSS. And we do have automatic reproduction steps. So uh, there's a lot to come with, like, essentially automating the flow. Um, yeah. Um, I said this before in my last talk. I don't really tweet, but that is my Twitter. And I will respond to you. But I don't, like, have cool things to say on Twitter. And uh, there's the GitHub uh, link to the source code. And uh, thanks for Shalcon for having us. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. What browser does it look like? Right now, it's pretty stable in Chrome and Firefox. Um, yeah, it's just like we use the regular. Chrome extension, and they're compatible with Firefox. And before we usually push to production, it's we make sure that they work for both. So, but yeah, it doesn't work for like Safari, I don't think, or Internet Explorer. But yeah. Uh, what would you say was the most challenging part of the implementation? Oh. Uh, yeah, with all the browser. Core. Yeah, there's a lot of like weird browser stuff. Like when we try to, for example, when we try to hook eval, uh, the way we hook in our HTMLs, we were using the um, the proxy APIs. If anyone's familiar with those, but essentially they allow you to write wrapper functions for like getters and setters and other types of method of invocations, uh, and you can't do that with eval because of how eval sees like the this context um, within its context. So whenever you call eval, it jumps. You can pass it at this context, but uh, I actually forget all the details. But it essentially breaks most apps when you do it. It automatically binds the local closure. So all the local variables are automatically bound. And one um, Webpack strongly uses that. So it like, breaks all websites, because all websites are using Webpack. Yeah. yeah, Webpack will put everything in a closure for you, which means eval can't see it when we jump into our method, essentially hook. I don't know. It, it, like a lot of weird like stuff like that, like getting the extension to talk to the DOM. Oh, we do a lot of like uh, Tracy the DOM browser extension sits in its own context, but then sometimes we'll inject scripts into the DOM so that uh, they can manipulate things. Like for example, that's how you get the context menu when you click on the the owl, and like getting that timing correctly was a pain. Like when scripts actually load and how to communicate them in time and. Um, the other thing I was going to say was uh, duplicate data. So Tracy actually does all deduping for you. You don't like if you reload a page with user input in it, it doesn't record it again because it knows that to be the same data. So a lot, getting all that deduping working was kind of a pain as well. I've also learned that UIs are hard. Yeah, <laughs> UIs, stuff, tough stuff. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Appreciate it.